Welcome back to the Menopause Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Gordon. And today we welcome back Dr. Sharazad Green to discuss hormones. Now, Dr. Green is a pharmacist who specializes in women's health, integrative medicine, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, adrenal fatigue syndrome, and sexual dysfunction. And today, Dr. Green goes over my blood test that I procrastinated sending to her. <laughs> and she gives me her unique perspective and recommendation about how to manage my hormonal situation. And I hope this is helpful for you. Now, during the interview, we discuss the labs that are required for a proper hormone consultation, why thyroid function is so important, what estrogen allergy is and why it doesn't exist, the importance of calcium in postmenopausal women, sexual dysfunction in menopause, and the role of vaginal dryness. It's something we never want to talk about, right? We don't want to talk about why, why we don't want to have sex. I mean, oftentimes it's because it's painful, but we're going to talk about this today. Uh, adrenal fatigue and how to combat it. Now, at the end of the episode, make sure you visit drmichellegordon.com slash podcasts. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T-S. -S. Don't forget the S, where you can find the show notes, plus uh, the links to the books and resources mentioned in the episode. If you enjoy the episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you're always the first to know when each episode is released. And thank you for all of the five-star reviews. I really appreciate it. Now, if you have any questions about the topics covered in this or any other podcast, I invite you to open a conversation with me on Instagram at Dr. Michelle Gordon. That's D-R-M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-G-O-R-D-O-N. I promise I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I'll also answer any emails that you send me, uh, Dr. Gordon at menopausemovement.com. And now also we talk about in the in the episode, we talk about Fabuvag, which is a special lubricant that Dr. Green herself designed. So let's move on to the interview with Dr. Green. Thanks so much for being a part of the menopause movement. And here we are back with Dr. Green. Oh, Dr. Green is here to talk about. So we interviewed Dr. Green way, way, way back in, in July, I want to say. June, oh, maybe? I can't remember. No, July, it's been yeah. A, month, a few months, yeah. Yes. July, and, and we decided that I would, we would have you come back and talk about my own, my own health and my own hormones and that sort of thing. And so with some trepidation, I have brought you back, even though I have tried to... Uh, to ignore it and not look at this. So, uh, so here we are. So I'm hoping Dr. Green that you can just uh, give the listeners and the viewers a, a little background on you and uh, what you do and, and how you help women in menopause. Absolutely. Thank you for having me back and I'll go easy on you. So don't <laughs> I'm <sweat nervous>. <laughs> <I know. laughs> I've been a pharmacist for about 30 years and uh, the past 20 years I I focused mainly on women's health and integrative medicine, talking to women, uh, giving them options basically about what they can do with their hormones and with their health. I also do this for men, but the majority of my patients have been women. Uh, any, any person who's got hormonal challenges, whether uh, premenopausal, perimenopausal, postmenopausal, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, after giving birth to a child, uh, some women go through postpartum depression. So all of that, you know, I've, I've been dealing with, as well as adrenal fatigue syndrome, which uh, we'll talk about eventually, about yours, uh -oh. and uh, <laughs> sexual dysfunction. So I've been doing that for the past 20 years, and it's just been wonderful because I've been able to hopefully help about 20,000 women out there. That's great. That's awesome. Well, you know, hopefully through the podcast, you'll be helping even more, you know? I That's the whole so. idea. Yeah. So. Um, all right. So when, when you were on the podcast, I told you I was going to go ahead and get, uh, get the labs drawn and send them off to you. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I did that, but it took me several months. And I still don't <laughs> think I gave you all of the labs you wanted. But if you want to just kind of get into it and just talk a little bit about the, the lab tests and why we get them, and then we can kind of go into diagnosing my own... Ooh, 
Yeah, your your <laughs> red <issues>. chart. <laughs> My red chart. Yeah, it's funny. You know, we have this saying. We call we call people who are like a little bit difficult. We call them yeah. red stars. Oh you know, gosh. People, they get red <laughs> stars on I their chart. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I have a system. The patients that I see face to face, I use a Manila chart for them. But the ones that I do virtual over the internet or over the phone, I use a red chart. So Got that's it. why you're a red chart. It's not because you're different. Okay. Uh, well, I am, so, but that's another story altogether. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the reason we do labs basically is to establish where things are as far as your hormones are concerned and your adrenal uh, glands are concerned. And it's true. There's always that uh, question whether... Uh, labs are necessary or reliable and in a sense to me yes they're necessary and as far as reliability it all depends yes they could vary from day to day or week to week but if we don't check them we we have no reference no point of reference especially for a postmenopausal woman after she hasn't had a period for 12 consecutive months then the labs become more reliable, actually, because things don't fluctuate as much. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons we check things. And then later on, as we start therapy or as your body changes, then we can always check your levels at that point and decide whether things have improved or not. Do they match your symptoms? Uh, is there something that we're missing or not getting absorbed or needs to be dosed differently? Okay. That's awesome. So what, what labs did we even do? <laughs> so in general, the labs that I usually recommend are for, for anyone who comes to me with kind of menopausal symptoms, I usually recommend to measure their estrogen levels. There's two estrogens that I ask for, estradiol and estrone sulfate. Those two are the, the two main ones. As estrogen level drops, there, there are a couple markers that go up indicating that you're getting close to menopause or you're in menopause. And those two markers are FSH and LH. So FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone and LH stands for luteinizing hormone. And right. those two levels usually go up. Now, after menopause, I may not even check LH, but if we're not sure, we usually like to check both of those. Okay. So estrogen drops, FSH and LH go up, basically. Then there's progesterone. And progesterone is basically the first hormone to drop in, in a woman's body as she gets closer to menopause. So typically, it's not your estrogen that drops first, but it's your progesterone that drops first. So that's really important. Does that and, also affect mood when, when, when yes. uh, women's progesterone drops? That's when they start to feel a little nutsy and yes. mood, you know, like brain fog, and there's some mood swings. Well, the, the, the mood swings especially is, is one of the main things that women and their partners or their loved ones complain about because it makes everybody kind of be edgy because if you're living with someone who's having irritability and mood swings you just don't know what to expect at any given moment so you're here for your life basically <laughs> living with that, that person but in in their defense I always say the woman who's having mood swings and irritability does not enjoy them either so she's just as miserable as whoever is complaining about her absolutely but basically uh yes as progesterone drops we feel more pms -y. So the premenstrual pre syndrome that we usually start experiencing maybe in our 30s and then 40s, it just gets worse and worse as we get closer to menopause. And it kind of stays with us and it becomes like a month-long PMS uh, instead of like just a couple of days before. Or years for some women. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it just keeps going on and on and on. But basically, progesterone is really important to check. It's very important for your moods, but also for your sleep and for your bones, and also to prevent uterine cancer if anyone, any uh, prescriber gives a woman estrogen and the woman has a uterus, then you do need to give them 
progesterone as well right. to prevent uterine cancer. So progesterone is one of the most important ones. That came out of the Women's Health Initiative, right? Or well, that, that has been known for forever, I think, because progesterone was... and the uterine lining, uh, you know, that's been something that's been going on uh, forever. Yeah. We, we know. I want to about... say it was the Women's Health Initiative in the 70s or 80s that, because oh, maybe, when... maybe it was. Yeah. Maybe it was, yeah. Uh, I, I, or it I'm might be the nurse's I... health study, but I don't, I don't remember which one it was, but I just, I do know that they had to stop one arm early because of uterine cancer or uterine cancer and right. Right. Pro, you know, because of the progesterone, the, the, the arm of women who had a uterus, endometrial cancer. That's what it was. Yeah, you're yeah. right. You're, you're absolutely right. I thought you were referring to the latest women's health, and women's health nah, initiative study. That his, was historical. Uh, right. More than yeah. anything else, I read, I read old studies. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Good for you. Yeah. Somebody has to read, so <laughs> to inform everybody. Okay, so the Women's Health Initiative, uh, progesterone and uh, unopposed estrogen can cause endometrial cancer. So we know that a woman who has a uterus must have uh, estrogen and progesterone to avoid endometrial cancer. That's right. Okay. The other things that we check uh, usually include free and total testosterone. Testosterone usually, again, the term usually here, uh, does not drop until later uh, later on, a few years after uh, you go into menopause, but in some women, it does drop significantly mm -hmm. before or at the onset of menopause. So it's important to, to measure your testosterone level. And if it's low, then we can uh, give you some supplementation. So. Right. All right. And uh, I also like to throw in DHEA sulfate. Now, DHEA sulfate... Uh, is a totally different subject and it's related to adrenal fatigue syndrome. But I usually like to uh, measure that because if it's really high or really low, then I know for a fact that there's, there are some other problems. Sometimes it comes back normal. And, and if I suspect that there is adrenal fatigue, then I also ask to check other things such as cortisol levels uh, through saliva testing. So the right way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has to be done four times in a given day. I don't know if you want to get in, in to that discussion right now, or we could save that for later, maybe. Yeah, oh, that's fine. Whatever works. Okay. All right. So uh, those are the main hormones that uh, we usually measure. Uh, I just to, uh, to make sure that none of your symptoms are related to your thyroid. I usually ask for your thyroid panel too because mm -hmm. sometimes thyroid imbalance could mimic hormonal female hormone imbalance right and so, so just as a as a as a caveat just as a, an explanation to because when we get to talking about my labs my thyroid's all out of whack and what happened was I, I was taking one type of thyroid replacement and I was having really really bad palpitations and I stopped it I just, I just abruptly stopped it because I didn't like feeling the palpitations and I was just like all the time having them. So I was taking something called Armour Thyroid, which is desiccated thyroid, I think from a, is it from a pig? Pigs, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it worked really well for me for a while. And then when we did a repeat, so I don't know if you got a copy of the repeat lab, so we did repeat. No. So, so I think my TSH was uh, 11 when... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it was like 10 with the repeat. So I went on. Oh, it just went down by one point? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It was either that or it was 12. I can't remember. It was somewhere in there. So so I went on uh, Synthroid, and I don't have palpitations. We haven't rechecked, but I feel, I mean, I, I didn't feel bad anyway. So uh, it's hard to say. It's very subjective. But, but the good news is I'm not having palpitations. But it was, uh, the doctor was concerned. Let's yeah, see. Absolutely. You know. So, so what dose of Synthroid are you on now? It's 50 micrograms. And when did you start that? I want to say probably about, about four or five weeks ago, because I've gotten a refill. I had a bunch okay. of samples. So yeah, I think, it's, I think it's four or five weeks ago. So it's probably time to re re recheck uh, again and see where my TSH is. But I'll probably wait, because we're getting ready to go on a big trip. And so I'll probably wait till we get back. Okay. Okay. And you're doing well. I don't feel bad. I mean, I didn't, you know, it's funny. I never had any symptoms of hypothyroidism. No. 
And the interesting thing about the, the repeat, because I clean up my diet, I don't have any thyroid antibodies. So mm -hmm. it's, it's probably, and, and I was, I was really tempted to decide whether or not I wanted to, because I had no thyroid antibodies, should I just not, you know, see if my body would heal itself uh, because mm -hmm. there were no thyroid antibodies, but I was talked into taking yeah. Synthroid. <laughs> well, and that's not the worst thing that you could take, honestly. I, for those of you, none of you have probably heard me talk about my thyroid. I don't have a thyroid gland. It was taken out several years ago. I had thyroid cancer. So everybody asks me, well, what do you take? And even though we're a compounding pharmacy and I, we make a lot of T3 and T4, you know, different combinations and whatnot, I say, you know, if try Synthroid or generic Synthroid, if it agrees with you, if you're doing well with it, then that's fine. And the fact that everybody says, well, it's synthetic. Yes, it's synthetic, but it's made in such a way that molecule for molecule, it's exactly the same molecule that your own body produces. So it's mm -hmm. T4. Now, granted, your own body has to convert the T4 to a more usable form of thyroid called T3. Uh, but again, if you're doing well and if your body is converting it properly, then there's no point in making it, uh, yourself and everybody confused trying to get something that, and in fact, uh, as a side note, if you have, if your thyroid antibodies are high and you try taking something that's derived from animals, such as armor thyroid or nature thyroid, that could potentially aggravate that autoimmune response and therefore your antibodies can go up meaning your body can start attacking your thyroid gland mm. thinking that it's producing something that does not belong to your own body okay. so you have to be kind of careful with that not not everybody needs to take fancy stuff sometimes we do but synthroid is a good place to start yeah i mean i feel i mean i feel pretty good on it, it used to be uh, when i was taking it I mean, I started taking Synthroid probably 15 years ago. And after taking it for about three years, one time I went on a trip and forgot it. And I felt mm -hmm. weird. Yeah. And I realized I didn't have it. And I had to pick some up at the, at the pharmacy. So what did you ha what were you taking that you started having palpitations? Armothyroid. I had switched. Okay. So probably about five or six years ago, I switched from Synthroid to Armothyroid. And I don't remember why. I think it was just something a little more natural. I, I don't remember the reason. Um, and I did fine on it and everything was fine until I started having palpitations and I changed my diet really, really a lot yeah. five years ago or so. And that's probably one of the reasons why the thyroid antibodies went away. Good. So you, you yeah. used to have high thyroid antibodies. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Back in 2005 when I was first diagnosed, when I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's. Okay. All right. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know about Hashimoto's, it's basically when your own body attacks your thyroid gland. So it's an autoimmune disorder. And some of the diets may help with uh, managing Hashimoto's. And just like Dr. Gordon said, she cleaned up her diet and that seemed to have helped, which is great. Yeah. And, and we talk a lot about diet in our in our course, the mental system, and we spend a lot of time talking about diet and autoimmune stuff and, and how to manage your, manage your diet. So there's, uh, there's a lot of information about how to become a mental mate and, you know, do the mental mate yeah. way of eating and uh, to help, to help with, with all of those things. Mm -hmm. So that's true. All right. So those are the, those are the main labs that we check. Of course, okay. then there was complete blood count and your metabolic panel, meaning your blood sugar and all that. So did you want to give us a history of where you are with your menopause or perimenopause when your last, uh, what your age is, what, yeah. when the last date of your uh, first day of your last menstrual period was and what your complaints or concerns are? So I'm 55. I was born October 25th, 1964. I don't remember when my last period was. I want to say it was five or six years ago, but I don't really remember. What I do remember is the last period I had was when I took hormone replacement. 
And so as soon as I got a period from taking hormone replacement and it was bioidenticals and I was like, nope, I'm done with this. I am not interested. And I just quit it right there. So my, my biggest concern, I mean, I had some mood swings and I had some brain fog, but when I, I, when I was able to eat differently and move my body differently, a lot of those symptoms went away. The thing that really has been the biggest struggle for me has been weight. Okay. You know, and I, I've tried a lot of different ways of eating and I was been, been able to gain and lose the same 20 pounds over and over for the last five years. But getting past that threshold has been really hard for me. To, and, and it's independent of exercise and it may or may not be excess calories. I've been, I've been doing, I've, I've started a, a new project where I'm logging every, everything I eat and I'm trying to keep my yeah. calories below 1500. Plus I exercise and I exercise hard. So I, yeah. I probably exercise six to eight hours a week easily. Okay. And it's, it's hard stuff where my heart rate goes up. Uh, I have a triathlete coach. I, I do all those, those activities. So I run and I bike and I swim. And I want to say, so for the last 50 days, uh, I'm down 10, 10 pounds, which is great. Okay. But for somebody, and for the first like three weeks of that, I was at a 1200 calorie diet and I was like, this is not sustainable. I can't do this. But over the last, uh, I want to say two weeks, actually since, since December 20, since December 20th, my weight has stayed the same. My weight has not changed Despite at all. Despite working out. Despite working out and watching my diet. And I'm very careful about what I'm eating. Okay. So number one, going back to the fact that you started bleeding when you started hormone therapy, even though it was bioidenticals, yes, that does happen, especially if we don't give you the right dose or we start therapy prematurely. As I was beginning to tell you, when we get close to menopause, it's not estrogen that drops, it's usually progesterone that drops. And one of the common mistakes that I see, again, I go back to 20 years of experience. So I've seen it, I've made mistakes. I, you know, I mm -hmm. didn't just come out and say, I know everything. So we, we learned from, from our sure. mistakes. But essentially when we give you estrogen prematurely before it's due, yes, you do get bleeding and then we have to kind of retract uh, and wait until you actually stop producing your own estrogen. So as a, as a woman gets close to menopause, her hormones go up and down, up and down. It's not, it doesn't stay low all the time, meaning estrogen. Progesterone and testosterone tend to kind of drop, you know, when they drop, they stay low. But estrogen yeah. especially goes up and down. And, and if we're not careful and we give you estrogen prematurely, then you do get, um, some, some women are told that they have allergies to estrogen. And I'm I'm like, no, there is no allergy <laughs> to your own hormones. There's hormones. no way that you could be allergic to them. Yes, you do get bloating. You do get a pms -y, breast tenderness, water retention. Those are because you're not supposed to get estrogen at that point or it's too much. So there's no such thing as estrogen allergy because we all, as women, we, we produce estrogen in our bodies. So we can't be allergic yeah. to it. Um, then we talk about the weight. Now, I think with you, because we've, uh, you know, checked your hormones and we, we need to talk about your female hormones, but just as a brief side note, I think some of your weight issue can be related to adrenal fatigue syndrome and the cortisol, which needs to be addressed. Okay. So did you want us to go over your female hormones first? Let's do the female hormones first, and then we'll go into uh, what adrenal fatigue is and, and okay. what, you know, how you're diagnosing me. Sounds good. So let me get my glasses here so I can read your okay. lines. I am going to do a consultation for you, just as if you are a patient coming to me for a consultation. Great. Okay. okay. Right. So Michelle or Dr. Gordon, you are 55 years old and you haven't had a period for several years. The last time you took bioidentical hormones, you experienced a, a period or vaginal bleeding and that's when mm -hmm. you stop. You are currently taking vitamin D and fish oil, but you're not taking any calcium. 
do you know what your average calcium intake is per day? Have you? No, but I eat a lot of green stuff. I eat a lot, a lot, a lot of dark green leafy stuff. Good. Okay. So yes, please make sure that you get plenty of calcium, probably mm -hmm. about a thousand milligrams a day, whether it's from your foods or from supplements, either way, it's fine. You can always find more information online. For example, if you eat a cup of broccoli every day, then you can look it up online and see how much calcium it's got. A glass of milk, a cup of yogurt, whatever you you know, sesame seeds are really high in calcium mm -hmm. too. So make sure that you get plenty because hormones protect your bones basically. And as you get into menopause and your hormones start dropping and declining, then that could adversely affect your bones. So you could lose that strength of your bones. You could have osteopenia and then later on osteoporosis. So those are uh, important things that you have to watch out for. The other things that are important for your bones are weight-bearing exercises Whatever makes your muscles strong makes your bones strong. So whatever you're doing when you exercise, if you're building muscles, then it's building bones for you. Yeah. I, mean, I do, I and, mostly, mostly do cardio stuff. I mean, it's, it's cycling, it's, it's intense cycling and running and swimming. Those, those are okay. my, you know, exercises. Yeah, upper body is one of those things that some women uh, tend to forget. And we see women with broken wrists or even ribs sometimes and that's that's something that we uh, don't focus on uh, very much mm -hmm. but if you could even get stretch bands and do a little bit of you know yeah no i've got I've, i do i do weights too but i just don't okay. do them as much yeah so yes vitamin d and calcium and weight bearing exercises and possibly hormones uh, those are the things that do help you with your bones you're not a smoker. Now, if you were a smoker, I would say no to hormones for you yeah. because smoking and estrogen are a bad combination. They could increase the risk of blood clots, heart attacks, and strokes. Yeah. So we don't want that. And you don't really consume much alcohol. Again, as a side note, alcohol could make people's hot flashes worse. So those of you who are having hot flashes, watch out for caffeine, alcohol smoking sugars and stress those are the top uh, yeah so as a matter of fact i think back in september we just decided to, to stop drinking uh we don't drink really i've had one drink since september and that is such a good thing uh, for many reasons i was actually listening to a study that was just published about how people after they they stopped drinking they realized that they're they feel a lot better in general. Yeah. Yeah. It's something, you know, when, when it comes to alcohol, it's pushed so hard in everything. I mean, when you watch TV, they're always drinking when you, right. you know, they're drinking and smoking, drinking and smoking, drinking and smoking. Mm -hmm. And I remember when they took cigarette ads off TV. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I don't understand why. I, th I think the reason why they have people in on TV shows and, and movies, do activities like smoking, which are so, so detrimental or, you know, it's, right. it's not because of sponsorship in, in movies, especially because they, you can't because of, because mm -hmm. of the laws. I think it's because they want to portray uh, an actor doing something and it makes it less boring for the, for the audience um, yeah. to watch somebody doing that. So it's, it's funny to watch certain shows where you could, it's obvious that, that the person who's smoking doesn't smoke. Right. And yet they have to for this. And, and it would be really nice to see a, a change, a shift that would say, you know, this is not something that we do. And the other thing is like with drinking and stress, every time some, an actor on a TV show has a stressful moment, they're pouring a drink. Isn't that true? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that just teaches us bad habits. Plus it's empty calories. It is. I mean, you could get the same antioxidants that's available in red wine. You could get it in a pill form. A plus more, so a <laughs> lot more concentrated uh, yeah. from resveratrol or some other antioxidants. So I I'm in agreement with you. Yeah. So good for you that you don't drink. <laughs> and let's see, you had you do not have a family history of female cancers, meaning my, your mom did not have breast cancer. No. My grandmother, my, my father's mother had breast cancer in her seventies. So okay. it's really distant. 
and it was after menopause that was in yeah, the 70s, yeah. and which yeah. makes it a little bit uh, better because then it's usually not hereditary that way, yeah. but when it's after menopause. So you have not had a bone density test. So that's something that I would like to recommend for you. The first thing that you want to do is do a baseline bone density test. We want to see your bone density at this point and then be able to compare it two, three years down the line to what it's gonna become. Hopefully your bones are good. The fact that you're consuming you know, calcium rich foods and exercising, that should help your bones. Mm -hmm. But if you do the bone density and the results come back abnormal, then that gives us even more reason to consider hormone therapy for you. Okay. All right, so as far as your, your symptoms are concerned, there is the weight gain that you mentioned. There's also decreased sex drive. Yes, yes. I did have a, a decreased libido uh, that was pretty severe. Um, but after I started taking thyroid, it came back. <laughs> <laughs> See, you treated yourself. And it's so amazing. Yeah. You're right. Thyroid has, has so much to do with so many things. So your, your sex drive has improved then. It has, Is that on yeah. testosterone or without testosterone? Actually, I'm off testosterone. I was taking You're testosterone off. before and it didn't help at all. Okay. So... All right, so right now you're good after you started thyroid. Okay, then there is hot flashes. Are you still having hot flashes? I do get hot flashes from time to time, okay. but it's not, they've never been disruptive. They're just weird. No. Like okay. they, they happen at the weirdest times and you know, I'll, be, I'll be interviewing a patient or something like that. And then all of a sudden I'll turn red from like ch my chest all the way up to my head. And I'm just like, look, I'm sorry. It's just, it's just menopause. <laughs> okay. Well, you're real. That's why. Yeah. Okay. And then um, do the night sweats actually wake you up? They do sometimes. I did like last night I had, I was completely drenched and it doesn't happen as much as it used to. And I don't have as many sleep disturbances as yeah. I used to. I, I did have for a while there, I was, I was waking up every night, like two and three times. Okay. So stress management has played a huge role. Exercise has played a huge role in that. Okay. Good, good. So. Yeah, you know, and I, I tell women sometimes if you've had a stressful day or depending on your caffeine and alcohol intake and sugar, you may have a rougher night. So uh, weigh yeah. your, you know, the goods and bads of whatever you're doing uh, and then also de-stress before you go to bed. That's a, that's a big one. Yeah, for sure. All right. So we're going to go through your lab results now. Now, right. these labs were drawn, uh, it looks like back in October, October 14th. <laughs> this is me being, it's, so it's currently January and this is, so it's the first week of January, the first full week of January, and this uh, episode won't, won't air until the second week of February. So this is me being a, a procrastinator because we, we did draw the labs and then we tried to, I did try to meet with you, meet up with you, you a little bit, but uh, then holidays came and whatnot. So it's just, just as context for, for, for the listeners. Okay, great. No, you did try. I think between the two of us, we couldn't yeah. really. So uh, just to go over things, I usually go over everything with my patients. So your complete blood count came back normal. And that usually means that if, if for example, your white cells are elevated, we think that you may be dealing with an infection. If your mm. red blood cells are low or hemoglobin is low, then we think that you may have some form of anemia. You did not have anything that was abnormal, but Yay. it's always good to, to check that probably once a year to make sure that you're okay. Then your blood sugar. I assume you were fasting for this blood test. I, maybe. I don't even know. <laughs> okay. It looks like it was normal at 91. Normal goes okay. from 70 to 100. So I assume that you were fasting. Then uh, there were some electrolytes your, uh, th that came back normal. Uh, just a side note, electrolytes, uh, sometimes I ask people, have you had a bone density test? They say, no, but my calcium has always been normal. Well, I have that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that anything. That doesn't mean anything because you're going to get all the calcium you need from your bones. That's, exactly. that's, the, that's the job. Exactly. Yeah. That's how you yeah. lose your bone density. So Exactly. Uh, so do not rely on your calcium. Yeah, on your no, blood calcium, calcium means level. nothing. Yeah. Right. Uh, your kidney function came back good. And your liver enzymes 
appear to be good. Now, another thing with drinking, sometimes your liver enzymes could get, get yeah. elevated too. The GGT especially. Yeah. Yeah. But everything was good for you. And then, okay, so testosterone. Now your testosterone was low. Mm -hmm. um, and I was on supplementation. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was definitely low. Your sex hormone binding globulin was normal. Now that one is something, think of SHBG or sex hormone binding globulin as the, uh, these sponges that float around in your blood. And if there is too much estrogen, they tend to kind of sponge them off, sponge off the estrogen, absorb the estrogen. Mm -hmm. Now, if your estrogen goes up too high, which I see occasionally when women get pellets, the hormone pellets, or mm -hmm. uh, they get high doses of estrogen, then SHBG goes up. So that's why we check that to make sure that your SHBG is not high and it's not indicating high estrogen. Your level was normal. Again, this is a baseline level that we're checking. Okay. And um, we're going to skip the cortisol. Uh, your thyroid, again, like you said, TSH or <laughs> thyroid stimulating hormone came back high. Thyroid is, is one of those funny things. If your TSH is high, that means your thyroid is being lazy. So yours yeah. was being lazy. So you addressed it. And that might have had something to do with helping you with the uh, weight loss. It does help as you know, with, with weight loss. Mm. Okay, then we get to the rest of your female hormones. There is LH and FSH. Remember I said as your estrogen levels drop, LH and FSH usually go up. And your levels were elevated, especially your FSH was 69.2. Normal for before menopause is less than 30. So if it's if you haven't been having periods and your FSH is over 30, then we say, yeah, you're in menopause. Got and it. that kind of correlates with the low estrogen level. We, we did measure two different estrogens. One was estrone, one was estradiol, and they both came back low, which is typical for post-menopause. Got it. And therefore, usually it's the low estrogen that causes in most women the hot flashes and night sweats, foggy brain and memory, um, some bone loss, dry skin. So although some, some people say that they... They don't have as much energy when their estrogen drops. So, And your progesterone level, which is my favorite hormone. Progesterone is kind of like avocado for me. It's like, you know, <laughs> I, I love progesterone as much as I, I love avocado. It does so many good things for you. And your progesterone level was very low. So again, it helps with your moods, your sleep, your bones. And in a way, it opens the doors for estrogen. So if we're giving you estrogen, and we have progesterone on board, it kind of it allows us to give you a little bit less estrogen because it opens the doors for estrogen. And most importantly, for women who have a uterus, again, you need progesterone to prevent uterine cancer. So, right. And that's as far as your female hormones go. We won't go into the rest of the stuff as far as your adrenal glands go. So for a typical patient, and you may or may not want to do this, uh, you have to remember Hormone therapy is a very individualized thing. It's not always uh, true that everybody has to go on hormones after menopause. Some women do fantastic without hormones. Some people prefer not to. I had one patient who was from the top tropics and she says, oh, I actually enjoy the hot flashes. It makes me feel like I'm at home. So <laughs> it's um, everybody's different, uh, basically. So sure. I'm going to tell you what I would recommend for you. And then we'll decide if you really want to try it or not. Okay. okay. So number one, I would, uh, I would say, yes, we could definitely do a, a low dose of progesterone to see if it would help you with some of the hot flashes slash, slash night sweats, help you sleep better. Your moods aren't too bad uh, as, as of now. You have a little bit of irritability, not too much mood swings, but you have a little bit of depression too. That's what was noted on the paper. Yeah, probably. I, it depends on the day. Some days I, some days I, I have, you know, I'm, I'm up and, and everything's great. I have to say that the depression has really gotten a lot better since I started meditating. And see, yeah. you are already doing everything that I'm going to tell you to do. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> good. You're a very yeah. good patient. So, <laughs> yeah. So if, if we were to try progesterone, we have two options. Primarily, we have more than two options, but I, I usually say either progesterone cream or capsule that's slow release. The difference is that progesterone capsule makes you sleepy. So for those of you who have difficulty sleeping through the night or falling asleep, then progesterone capsule is a better choice. Otherwise, progesterone cream could be, a, uh, could be just as good minus the, the drowsiness and you know, effect on sleep. Uh -huh. So we could start you on a low dose. And this is when I leave it kind of up to you. If you want, which one would you prefer? Because with progesterone slow release capsule, you only take it once at bedtime. With progesterone cream, I usually want you to use it twice a day. Uh, and you use it usually on the forearms uh, where there's all the blood vessels and then there's thin skin and there's not much fat underneath that mm -hmm. skin. So the absorption is excellent. So you do it twice a day to keep more even. Well, if I were going to do it, I would take a pill. Right. Well, you being a surgeon and scrubbing so much, you probably would not leave much uh, progesterone on your forearms. For yeah, too probably long not. Because <laughs> yeah. you're going to be washing. And that's the th thing because there are patients who say, well, I'm an avid uh, swimmer. So if you swim all the time, then that's going to be a problem. Right. Another case, if you have a daycare and you're constantly touching little ones or you take care of your grandkids, you don't want to pass that progesterone from your skin into their skin and their right. body. So that's when I actually kind of dissect it and say, okay, which one do we want to do here? So let's, uh, let's say we do a progesterone capsule for you. If we're going to do progesterone capsule, uh, my average dose is 100 milligram slow release capsule, but I would probably start you with 50 milligrams. Too much progesterone could cause tiredness, increased grogginess, and people wake up with, with, an, uh, with a hangover. So we want to try a low dose and see how you do with it. And then if need be, we can increase it. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we have to be careful is that if we were to give you estrogen, systemically, then we have to be really careful with that to make sure that we give you enough progesterone. Sure. Okay? That makes sense. So the next question is, well, do we want to give you any estrogen? I think in your case, I would like to hold off on what we call systemic estrogen. Systemic is, again, something that you apply here and it kind of goes throughout your whole body, through your blood. So that's called systemic. And the reason I'm thinking, well, maybe hold off on that is because your symptoms aren't that severe. We're going to wait to get your bone density test to see if you actually need more help as far as hormones are concerned to help your bones. And we'll see if progesterone alone, how much does it do for you? Does it help you enough or not? Okay. That's the conservative me. You know, <laughs> but then if, if you came to me and you said, hey, you know, these hot flashes are killing me, I just can't stand it, or you came to me at, with a report of osteoporosis, then my answer would be totally different. If you came to me and you said, yeah, I, I'm just like you are today, but um, I also have this blood disorder where I, I've had three blood clots in my life then I would say absolutely no estrogen <laughs> no. for you. So no. there, that's, that's why you want to talk to someone who knows what they're doing to assess the pros and cons and not sure. just put everybody on the same dose. Now, low estrogen could cause vaginal dryness. So may I ask you how your vaginal dryness is? It's, uh, it's, it's okay. It's okay. All right. Yeah. So... Uh, may I explain to women about vaginal dryness? Absolutely. This is one of the most common things that I deal with. The thing is, is that, you know, we, we like to have sex, but we don't like to talk about sex. And, right. and, and so it's, it's like this big taboo subject where, you know, it's like this thing that we do, but no one wants to tie, especially in America. America, it's right. like this, this non-discussed non subject. And it can be such a, I mean, it can be such a, 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 a joyful thing and, and a way to keep a relationship going, or it can be this source of like difficulty. Resentment and, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So vaginal dryness happens more often than, than we think it does. 
just like you said, because people don't come out and announce it. If, if you have real dry skin and it's flaky, people can see it and you can talk about it potentially. Uh, and you may even be at the store and somebody would look at your hands and say, oh my gosh, I have this problem and I use such and such cream or lotion and it helped me. But vaginal dryness is not something that... <laughs> No one's going to talk about that. <laughs> right. So it's a, it's a little bit tough to talk about. But um, that's when I actually focus on uh, vaginal dryness and its effect uh, because it, it doesn't just affect you, but if it could affect your partner. Uh, and then you, you could also have residual effects uh, as far as your bladder function goes. Mm -hmm. Some women start having bladder issues, uh, leakage. Uh, frequency where they have to run to the bathroom all the time, urgency with they can't hold it. Uh, so, and then some people have actually uh, recurrent urinary tract infections or yeast infections because uh, par partially because of vaginal dryness. So, as your estrogen level drops throughout your whole body, uh, your vaginal tissue is very sensitive to that change of estrogen and it becomes really dry. So the lubrication kind of pretty much stops. So as you don't have enough lubrication in that area, the tissue becomes thin and dry. And sometimes it actually cracks and uh, you may even see a tinge of blood when you wipe yourself. And that's usually because there's a tiny tear in the vaginal tissue or on yeah. the outside that's causing the bleeding. The, the way I describe it is if you go out in the cold, dry weather, you don't take good care of your hands and let it just get dry. It gets really flaky and it starts cracking and bleeding, right? So that tissue does not have the right sensation to begin with. And then on top of that, you have some bleeding and cracking. So imagine if you want to try and rub something on it, you know, over and over, well, that's going to not be pleasant. That's going to be very <laughs> that's why. That's why you have painful sex because you don't have enough lubrication. And exactly. that comes from not having enough hormones. Right. And you could use something over the counter to, to help with the lubrication, but they usually don't last as far as the lubricants are concerned. And a lot of them are full of harsh chemicals. So that's, uh, that's when I get a little bit picky about those things. And that's where you have, you have a, don't you have one, a Vegafem or what do you call it? I, I have Fabuvag. Like Fabuvag, right. Fabuvag. Yes. And that one I developed because uh, it's one of my biggest pet peeves for women who don't speak up. Yes, vaginal dryness is uh, an actual problem and there are multiple solutions to it. We do absorb certain things, uh, chemicals included from the vaginal tissue. So we have to be really careful what we put in there. Yeah. And Fabuvag is 100% natural. So, uh, and it's got fennel, the herb fennel. So I developed it based on a study that shows fennel vaginal cream helps with both the dryness and sexual function for women. So it's, it's a bonus. Hmm. But besides that, I want you to know that if your vaginal dryness is really bad, I don't want you to suffer. There are also prescription uh, estrogen vaginal creams that are available. There are some compounded ones that are milder. There are also some uh, prescription estrogen vaginal creams that are basically commercially available. They're not compounded. There's also vaginal tablets uh, by prescription. So do not suffer because it's not gonna get any better, I guarantee you. And I, I'm always appalled when a patient comes to me and says, yeah, my doctor told me to go home and have more sex, that, that having more sex is going to bring more lubrication. And I'm like, and how, how long do you have to suffer until that actually happens? Yeah, That's right. It's just insane. So I get very emotional about vaginal dryness, <laughs> <laughs> as you can tell. Yes, like, yes. It's not women. All right, so we we've got Fabuvag, and and they can um, they can go to your website to get that, right? Anyone can right, go there. Right. And Fabuvag. what's the website? Fabuvag.com. Okay, we'll right. make sure we we hook that up in the show notes. Thank you. All right, so let's moving on to the next. So you want to give me you want to give me progesterone, and I want to take a pill. So it's gonna make me sleepy at night, which probably isn't such a bad thing. 
I've, right, I've right. improved my sleep quite a bit over the last uh, six to eight weeks, but I still That's have great. a long way to go. So that, that might help. Is there anything else that you'd want to give me uh, before we go into talking about what adrenal fatigue is and what your diagnosis and, and treatment would be for that? Sure. So um, going back to your testosterone level, your, your free testosterone was a little bit high, if I'm not mistaken here. Well, that might be because I was on supplementation. At that time. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Your total testosterone was 28, which was good. And your free testosterone was slightly high at 4.1. Um, and you were on testosterone supplementation. So yeah. study after study has not been able to prove that testosterone actually helps women's libido. However, didn't I still help mine. use it. Right. I still <laughs> didn't use help mine it. at all. And that's the thing, because I always say, look at sexual function as a multi-piece jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. That's got all these different pieces that have to fit in perfectly. And if you don't have a piece or a piece is, you know, broken, then it won't look good. It won't be perfect. And sexual function in women is so complicated. It's, it's related to so many different things. One is your overall testosterone. One is your overall estrogen. That, that could play a major role in your sexuality. One is uh, vaginal dryness. The blood flow to the uh, genitals are very important. Yeah. Uh, then there is also the chemicals in your brain, dopamine, for example, oxytocin. Oxytocin, yeah. Right. So we have all these different things that uh, when, when a patient comes to me and says, you know, I, I don't have any sex drive, then we start with the obvious thing, which, you know, in your case would have been testosterone when your testosterone was low. And if that doesn't work, then we have to look at other factors. In your case, thyroid was another factor too. And the fact that you lost weight, that always helps uh, with, with sex drive and your libido. Uh, then there is also psychological factors that come to play, the length of the relationship, the quality of the relationship, the worries and uh, concerns that you have generally in life. Are you worried about your teenager you know, not coming home on time or you know, your work situation, whatever it might be? So there's a lot of things that goes into this pot of uh, sexual function for women. For men, it's, the pot is much smaller and, you know, less complicated but for yeah. women it's very complicated uh, but in your particular case if there was a reason for me to now go back to progest uh, to using testosterone for you that would be to help you build some muscles and hopefully rev up, rev up your metabolism because testosterone can help you build muscles not by not exercising but if you use testosterone if you have enough of it and you exercise, then the muscles are going to be more toned and hopefully with more muscle mass and tone, then your metabolism will be better. Got that's it. And that's why, that's that why women in. who get the pellet tend to lose weight because they probably build more muscle just from the same exercise that they do. Initially <clears> they do, but then as pellet after pellet comes into their body, then be, they become too thick and bulky. So, mm. and they retain fluids. So you have to be really careful. Again, too much of anything good is not good. So sure. if I were to do testosterone for you, there are a couple of different options. Testosterone in a pill form, we usually don't recommend because it could cause liver problems, but we could uh, make it for you, compound it for you. It's not commercially mm. available. A compounded uh, cream would be possible. Yeah. Uh, then there I mean, I have, I have compounded cream. I could probably just start using it again. Yep. Where were you putting it? Uh, usually in the thigh. Okay. So I usually say, try to put it where there's less fat, uh, such as behind the knees. Mm. Okay. Uh, because when, when you use the, the area, the inner thigh, basically there, there is usually some fat under the skin and testosterone tends to stay get absorbed and stay in that fatty tissue more so than get distributed so it would be a, a better idea to put it behind the knees or even on the external genital area uh, if you choose to kind of rotate it 
but I don't recommend putting it on, on your forearms because then you may get hairy arms over here. Yeah. Just kind of yeah. feel like. But um, it does it does cause a little bit of uh, extra hair in weird places. Right. And that's that's one thing that you have to be careful because yeah. if you get too much testosterone, not only you have more body hair and facial hair, but you may also start losing hair up on your scalp. So it does the opposite uh, yeah. for your scalp. So you have to be really careful. But uh, so for, uh, there's testosterone cream, there's testosterone lozenges or trochees, and we also make some drops that you could put under your tongue. Okay. So there's different options for women. Awesome. All right. So any other hormones you want me to take other than before we get into adrenal fatigue? No, I think that's a good start, again, with progesterone alone and then a little bit of testosterone. Now, you do need to tell me what your dose of testosterone is, and then I'll guide you as far as yeah. what all I'd you have to look to at the, uh, I'd have to look at the, Label. the thingy from, yeah, okay. it's from the, it came from a compounding pharmacy. So. Okay. All right. All right. So let's get into adrenal fatigue, and let's start with what is adrenal fatigue? I am so glad you asked. <laughs> I think so many of us have adrenal fatigue that um, it's just amazing and we don't even know it. But so adrenal glands, what are the adrenal glands? Adrenal glands are two glands, uh, one on top of each kidney, and they help you get uh, through stressful situations. An example, your dog gets sick, you stay up three nights in a row, take care of the dog, and still during the day you wake up, you do what you have to do whether it's going to work or running your you know, household, whatever it is. So that you can do the first three days and nights uh, because your adrenal glands are giving you that extra energy and oomph to, to actually make it through. After that time, then uh, it is expected that the dog gets well, you catch up on your sleep and everything goes back to normal and your adrenal glands basically replenish and recharge themselves and wait for the next event next emergency that's what they're designed to do for you as far as adrenal fatigue goes now if the dog remains sick or if the, the dog gets well and the cat gets sick or one of them dies basically chronic ongoing stress or acute sudden major stress then your adrenal glands have to work extra hard to help you cope with that situation and initially, again, they work really, really hard until they get very tired and exhausted. And when they get tired and exhausted, they can't keep up with the demand. Then you feel tired and exhausted. Then you cannot sleep well at night. And oftentimes, people start putting on weight. So those are the three hallmarks of adrenal fatigue. You know, tiredness. Sounds like you're, you're talking, talking about what it's like to be a surgeon. You know, we don't sleep, we get up at night, we're stressful in the OR, you can't make a mistake. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, you know? it's hard. And um, it's kind of like, you know, I, I look at the adrenal glands just like a flashlight that you're recharging, it's plugged in and ready to go, uh, you know, to turn on during an emergency. So if the lights go out in my room and... Uh, I have that flashlight, I just unplug it and turn on the light and I can, I can make do. I can live off of that temporarily. But if I want to use that flashlight every day, it won't work. Mm -hmm. It just needs time to recharge and to kind of get itself back to 100%. Oftentimes we don't allow that to happen though. Well, I just want to, just for the, for the sake of completeness, I also sure. want to talk about, uh, so we have, there's a couple of different types of you know, there's, there's mineral, mineral corticoids and then there's the adrenal corticoids, right? Uh, no, they're both, Gluco, what is it? Glucocorticoids yeah. and, and then, and then mineral corticoids right. and the mineral ones are the ones that maintain blood pressure. And that's so important because if you, if you have a deficiency of those, then you're going to have some, some passing out. And the glucocorticoids are the ones that we always hear about the ones that the, that the bodybuilders take to get bigger muscles. So, um, so the adrenal glands basically produce a lot of different things without getting too technical to help you get through everyday life, everyday stress. And usually we're supposed to give them a break when we 
you know, on a daily basis, essentially. And we don't, especially I always say any working woman uh, definitely has adrenal fatigue because mm. we're women and men, even women who don't work outside the house i'm sure they you know there's a lot of other stresses there's the stress mm -hmm. of uh, family life and you know, finances and uh, sometimes moving across the country relationship problems there's a lot of different things that can lots and lots of stresses there's i mean just living your life you're going to have stress exactly <laughs> you know uh, now for kids it's kind of interesting i always uh, envy kids because uh uh they're put in time out and the, the timeout is actually really good. If we could just do that for ourselves, put ourselves in timeout, then we could regroup and kind of like relax and say, okay, well, you know, is this worth it for me to, to have this much well, anxiety over that's, or whatever? That's what meditation is for. Exactly. Meditation exactly. is your way of, of, of really getting a timeout and, and going in and doing self-discovery. The problem is, is that in America and, you know, most of the Western, Western world, we, we're not taught it. And when we try to do it, we think that we have to shut down our brains. And so it makes it really hard. And when we understand that the job of the brain is to think, and our job as a meditator is just to let the thoughts go by and, and kind of let the experience be what the experience is and try to live in whatever the moment is that is, that is coming, that's, that's where, because that's, that sounds so foreign to, to talk like that. It's not something that we ever talk about in America. So yeah. in, in, so, all right. So we got stress and, and our adrenals are working overtime and they're working and working and working and pumping out cortisol and pumping out cortisol and pumping out cortisol. And then what happens? So if they weren't, if you were a healthy person with no adrenal fatigue, I would expect to see your cortisol um, to have a kind of a rhythm where in the morning you should wake up with the highest amount of cortisol to start off your day mm -hmm. fresh with lots of energy. And then as the day goes on, your cortisol kind of drops, drops, drops until you go to bed when it should be at its lowest level. Okay. So it kind of like, you know, goes like this kind of, like, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a lot, it's a reverse logarithmic. Goes, yeah, exactly. So yeah. once you go to bed, your cortisol is supposed to remain low and you're supposed to be sleeping. So your adrenal glands get a chance to actually rest and replenish themselves and then wake up early in the morning, start making cortisol for you. And you wake up again with uh, what I call a cup full of cortisol. Right on. Now, if you have adrenal fatigue syndrome, oftentimes what I see is people wake up with not a high cortisol level where it should be, but below what what's desired so you your cup is half full okay so you don't have as much energy as you should so what do we do first thing in the morning oftentimes we resort to caffeine because that's going to give us some energy and some juice to to start the day so you raise your cortisol level and then you crash a couple hours later then what do we do you're at work you're in the middle of a situation where you know it's stressful or you are hungry and you may grab a snack that's high in sugar and or caffeine chocolate whatever so then that again raises your cortisol level and then you crash a couple hours later mm -hmm. so you keep doing that enough times during the day that at night your adrenal glands think that that is what they're supposed to do. So they keep repeating that pattern at night, even though you're not feeding them. So oftentimes, how many times you hear people say, I wake up in the middle of the night for no reason. I know I'm tired. I know I should go back to sleep, but I can't. And that's because your cortisol is high. You have to wait until your cortisol drops low enough until you fall asleep. Okay. So, so I don't have any of those habits. And you're still saying that I have adrenal fatigue. The only one that I might have is uh, I drink some caffeine. Uh, I'll have tea or coffee in the morning. Well, I, but I'm I not a sugar eater at all. Disagree with you. As far as uh, you don't have those habits, you're right. You don't do caffeine or sugar. But the fact that you are in a position where you're dealing with stressful things. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got to be ready to go. You can't just be like, oh, I'm so relaxed and I'm going to go do surgery now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right, right. So 
it's a rush. So whatever raises your cortisol is, is what I'm talking about. An average person usually resorts to those things, plus, you know, everyday life stresses. In your case, you've managed to eliminate those awful things, but you still have the stress and you've done everything right. I mean, the fact that you're meditating really in reality, yeah. when people come to me and they have adrenal fatigue, that's one of the basic things that I teach them. And I say, if you cannot just meditate on your own, do download an app or two on your phone and listen to it multiple times a day, put, put it on notifications where it just pops up and reminds you that you need to meditate for a few minutes because that is teaching your adrenal glands to calm down it's okay. You don't need to go up and down all the time. And hopefully if you can catch it before your cortisol goes up, then it kind of um, sets the, the pattern for your adrenal glands where mm -hmm. they're not going to be all over the place. So you're okay. doing exactly what, what you're supposed to do. Uh, but in general, we don't. We, we tend to ignore those signs. We tend to wake up tired and do consume something that's going to give us energy and then go to work and deal with a thousand different things and come home, possibly drink alcohol, uh, watch something on TV. That's not necessarily relaxing and then expect ourselves <laughs> like to horror go to movies. Bed. Yeah. And then expect <laughs> ourselves to go to bed and fall asleep and no problem. Well, you know what? Your cortisol is high and it's yeah. going to go up and down, up and down. And that's what it's. So going. what's the fix? The fix is, uh, number one, first of all, you, we do need to get your cortisol level four times in a given day. So morning time, around noonish, afternoon, and then before you go to bed. And then based on that, then we can come up with a plan of action. But in reality, what it comes down to is, number one, is to remove the stress. Number two is to de-stress, which we talked about. Number three is lifestyle modifications, which means avoid those things that cause your cortisol to go up and down. And if you don't have to be in the middle of a stressful situation, remove yourself. Yeah. So, so this is all, I mean, you say this and I hear it and then, and then I have to go in and, and take, you know, take out somebody's gallbladder emergently. And so exactly. it's, I think it's really even, even, you know, for me, I mean, I'm a high stakes profession, right. Mm -hmm. But, but for the regular person who is not a surgeon for, you know, the woman who is working at home and comes home and has to cook dinner and still has to clean the house and do, does all these things. These are, these are regular stressors. Yeah. And how, how do you, how do you, for me, I mean, I'll, I'll never, you know, unless I stop operating, I'll right. always have that stress. So is there, I mean, everybody's looking for a magic pill, right? So right. is there some sort of a magic pill that you would recommend, you know, or do you say that, that it's really a matter of mindfulness and meditation? There are some supplements that I do recommend actually, but you have to be very judicious and very careful in what supplements you take for your adrenal glands. It could easily backfire. It could easily cause more problems, but one of the best things that you can do for your adrenal glands is take a high dose of vitamin C, for example. Vitamin C's um, concentration in the adrenal glands is very, very high. So your adrenal glands do need at least 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. Uh, a good B-complex is essential for your adrenal glands. And then after that, then we talk about things that are called adaptogens. Now, adaptogens mm -hmm. are herbal supplements that help you get um, kind of handle the stress better. Uh, one of my favorite adaptogens is ashwagandha, which is an ancient herb. And you can find it in many places, but there are also different combinations. Uh, well, you can use it as a tea things. and, and, uh, you know, ashwagandha is, uh, is it that that's like a de-stressor, right? Right. It's uh, an adaptogen, which you're right. It, it helps us cope with stress, essentially. Uh, there's holy basil, there's L-theanines. There's a few things that we, uh, we resort to. And I have uh, actually, you know, I have kind of a regimen that's not too expensive. And I tell patients, this is what I recommend that you take because you could easily go online and spend a couple, you know, $300 a month 
on adrenal supplements. And I always make sure that my, my patients understand the cure is not in the pills. The pills are there to help you. Right. They're not going to cure you if you're not going to change anything else. So, so the cure really for uh, adrenal fatigue, then you're saying is, is really managing your stress and, and making sure that you have the right kind of diet and exercise and those sorts of things, all the things that we teach in the middle system. So we've got meditation is huge to manage stress, vitamin C, B complex, adaptogens, and ashwagandha is your favorite. Uh, Is there anything else when it comes to adrenal fatigue and managing that? No, I think that's, you know, having a good sleep habit, uh, sleep hygiene, that's really important. Uh, Yeah, you know, it's, we talk, we talk a lot about sleep. We mm-hmm. talk a lot about sleep because as we age, it's really hard to, to get enough sleep. And then, you know, when the brain fog hits, we get brain fog, not only from our hormones, but from not sleeping. Oh yeah. So it's, it's, everything is related. It's crazy. Yep. So. And exercise in moderation. I would not recommend that an average person all of a sudden starts exercising, uh, taking a boot camp or anything like that, because it's just not going to serve them well. It just, access the adrenal glands even more. Yeah. I, I'm completely of a different view there. I think that if people want to exercise and they want to do a boot camp, I think they should. And then they but should not just all take... of a sudden, are you? I, I don't know. I mean I'm kind of an I'm kind of an all or nothing gal. So really? if I'm gonna do okay. something, I'm gonna I'm gonna go all in and do it, do it really, really and 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 just just rush right into it. The problem for me is like when I lift weights, I lift weights really hard and then I get delayed onset muscle soreness. I can barely walk for a couple of days afterwards. So yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> it's just, but I, that's just me. I mean, I, you know, I'm sure that there are, there are plenty of people who are watching who, who relate to that. And then others who are like, God, I never want to exercise. But you know, there's a lot of people who have yeah. lost weight uh, just by, by counting calories, right? That's true. Yep. And so, you know, for me, I gained, when I got menopause, I gained probably 60 pounds, 60, 70 pounds. Wow. And, uh, and I lost it. I lost the 50 pounds, but I still have another, you know, 30, 40, f- maybe 50 pounds I'd like to drop, uh, that came on, you know, after having a baby and whatnot. And it's just, it's, you know, as I said, it's been since December 20th, my weight has been about the same. So it was, it's, uh, that's about three weeks ago right now based mm-hmm. on, um, based on where we are, you know, it's going to be airing later in February, but, and, and so I've decided that the best thing for me to do is just to follow the process, make sure I watch the calories, make sure I do the yeah, exercising. You're right. And, you know, I don't know that there's a whole lot of hormonal help out there. And I think that the, the biggest issue that when it comes to weight loss, we talk a lot about weight loss in, in the membership and, and on the lives and also in the podcast is that consistency is key. Mm-hmm. And diet is the number one thing. And so if you can yeah. follow your calories right. more than anything else, um, you know, menopause, you're, you're going to lose your estrogen, you're going to gain some belly fat. But mm-hmm. if you want to lose it, um, adding estrogen back to your diet, uh, to your to your body is not necessarily going to give you that, you know, that that weight loss that you're looking for. You know, we, we as, as we lose muscle mass, it's you know, as we age, we lose muscle mass and then our, our, our basal metabolic rate dose goes down and we don't burn as much. And, and we have all those things that happen. And so mm-hmm. consistency following how much we're eating, trying to burn more than we, than we put in is the biggest right. thing. And, and, you know, until you start tracking everything you put in your mouth, you don't even know how much you're actually eating. Right. No, I, you know. I totally so, agree. so I, I use, I use an app to, to just track everything and, and I figure, you know, even if I've gone three weeks without weight loss, it's going to come. It's just my body saying, what are you doing? Right. And, it, you know, again, I go back to the same jigsaw puzzle as we were talking about libido. I think weight loss or weight gain, whatever, weight management yeah. is the same thing. There are so many different pieces that go into that puzzle. You're right. Adding estrogen may not reverse. In fact, I don't think it necessarily I've ever seen it reverse some of these weight gains, but it may prevent it, prevent the body from wanting to hold on to the fatty cells. So it may make it easier to lose mm-hmm. weight or not gain weight. Uh, adding testosterone, if your testosterone is low, again, may indirectly help with your metabolism because you're building muscles. Adrenal fatigue, if your cortisol keeps going up and down in the middle of the night, every time that it goes up when it's not supposed to, 
could definitely affect your weight. It could cause weight gain. So that's why we talk about the adrenal fatigue. One of the reasons we talk about the adrenal fatigue is to maintain that cortisol throughout the night and hopefully avoid that nighttime rise in cortisol and weight gain. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's a lot of things, and of course, you know, there's diet and exercise, and you know, you have to you have to be really mindful. There's our metabolism that just slows down in, in general as we get yeah. older. And there's yeah, you know, it's it's do. and it's not fair because men. Man, man, my son, I he started tracking his diet, his his food, and he started paying attention to what he was eating. And he lost eight pounds in the first week. And I'm like, God, you know, it's just not fair because when men try to lose weight, man, they just they just yeah. stop drinking soda and they'll drop, they'll lose weight. Women, it's a lot harder for us. And it's just because we have a yeah. very, very different metabolism. Unfortunately, all the weight loss studies, most of them, and you know, it's starting to change now, but weight loss studies, heart attack studies, hypertension studies, all those things, all these health studies have been done on men because yeah. we live in a patriarchy. And I bring it up all the time. I, I always talk about the patriarchy because you, know, you don't have to wait for someone's permission. You can do whatever you want. And, and you know, the, the, the way that women have been you know, kind of had, the, had a, the boot of the man on, uh, on their neck you know, mm-hmm. throughout all of history is, is really frustrating yeah. to me. So, you know, call yeah. me a feminist if you want. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So just to sum up, you want me to take 100 milligrams of progesterone, right? No, I think we decided to do oh, 50. 50. Right on. Because 100 okay. is the average dose and we decided to go a little bit slower. Okay. If you take too much progesterone, that could increase your appetite. We don't want that. Oh, no, we don't. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's, already, it's already hungry all the time anyway you know, even though I'm trying to, to cut back. So 50 milligrams of progesterone, you want me to resume testosterone, but I have to tell you what I'm, what I'm using. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, um, and continue with my mindfulness and uh, give you a full, a full cortisol breakdown and actually add in, I, I take a B complex, but I don't take any ashwagandha and I don't take vitamin C and I'm, I'm, the one thing I wanted to say about vitamin C is that you can really take as much as you want because it'll just be, it'll just come out through the kidneys. So it'll just make your right. urine super yellow. That's true. Unless you we have, unless you have kidney failure, don't, don't do that. So, but, but if you have normal kidney function, then it's okay to take as much, kid, as much vitamin C as you want. And vitamin C is great because it's really, it's needed in collagen crosslinking. It helps, it helps repair wounds. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a, it's a really important one. So I'm going to definitely take you up on the vitamin C as far as the rest of them go. I don't know for sure yet, but I'll have it. Yeah. I'll have a talk with the doctor about it and, and see. I think you're on the right track. Again, you, you've started this path already. So I, and, and you've seen improvements and that's yeah. the main thing. And if you recall, I, I did tell you the cure is not in the pill. The cure is more so in the first three steps that we talked about, uh, removing the stress, de-stressing lifestyle changes. And then the fourth one was the supplements. And again, I discourage people from going out there, spending a ton of money on supplements when you don't even know what you're supposed to take or if you even need to take certain things. Yeah. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to, to let you know what to take. And where can people find you? Uh, they can always email me, Dr. S. Green, Rx, at Outlook.com. Okay. And do you have a website? My website for FabuVag is uh, another way you can reach that's, me. Okay. FabuVag.com. All right. And that's, so this has been really great. It's, it's long. And so uh, I'm sure the team will break it up a little bit, but it's been really awesome. So, and actually I want to come back in, in a few months again oh, absolutely. and, and uh, have you, have you look at, you know, especially if I start taking the progesterone and we'll see yeah. where the, where the hormones are in a few months. Absolutely. So, I think that would right. be great. Thank you so and, much. Thanks for, thanks for being a part of the menopause movement. And listen, if you have any questions for Dr. Green and you want me to address them, I'll bring her back in to answer your questions. All you got to do is just send me an email, drgordon at menopausemovement.com. All right. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Green. I appreciate you. And, you know, I'll wait for the next time. Hopefully it won't be six months. (laughs) Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Menopause Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Gordon, and I wanted to take a moment to share what one of our community members has achieved since she's been working with me. Amanda has had an amazing transformation. 
Amanda was struggling with joint pain, hot flashes, forgetfulness, sleeplessness, weight gain, and an angry mood. In addition, she lost her confidence and self-worth as menopause crept up on her. Since joining the Menopause Movement membership, Amanda's quality of life has improved in ways no one could have predicted. She has truly transcended the symptoms of menopause and is now living her best life. This is what I want for everyone in the community. Take a listen to Amanda's story. I just want to show you what's possible when you join the community and do the work. Transcendence is available for you too. Now here's Amanda. Hi, my name is Amanda. I am 54 years old and I live in the UK. At this moment in time, I'm in a fairly good place in my life. Recently, I've lost 18 pounds and I feel healthier and more content than I have done in a long time. However, it hasn't always been this way. Back in October 2011, I had an accident which resulted in a serious injury and surgery and subsequently changed my life forever. And over the next few years during my recovery, Menopause crept up on me, but I didn't realise what was happening straight away. I started suffering from more joint pain. I went from always being cold to feeling like I was going to internally combust several times a day. I was getting really forgetful. My sleep pattern was terrible. I piled the weight on and looked pregnant and I felt angry all the time. When things were at their worst, I felt incredibly alone and very down. I lost my confidence and self-worth and I felt completely misunderstood and confused about what was happening to me. I received very little support or information from my GP and there was limited information on the internet, but what I really wanted and needed was someone to talk to. The turning point for me was at the beginning of July 2019, when completely by accident I came across Dr Michelle Gordon's Facebook page on the menopause movement. At that time, she was doing daily live streams and I started listening to them. I related to a lot of what she was saying and I was really interested in the variety of topics about menopause that she was talking about. The alternative ways to manage menopause symptoms in a more natural way and how your mindset is the key factor to transforming your life more positively. I was also really interested to listen to the other ladies in the group and what they had to say. Ladies who had been or were still suffering from similar symptoms to me. How a lot of them have been able to manage their symptoms much better and how they have turned their lives around and embraced menopause instead of treating it like a demon. Although nervous about taking a risk to join a group I didn't know, I knew that I couldn't and didn't want to carry on living my life the way I was and feeling the way I was feeling. So I made a decision that I too wanted to learn more about menopause how to manage my symptoms better and, most importantly, learn more about my mindset and the fact that I needed help with changing my outlook on life in order for me to get it back. Life is nowhere near perfect and some days I still have my struggles, but on the whole, I can honestly say that I am in a much better place than I have been for a long time and for my down days, I understand better how to manage them so they don't get out of hand. I am now on a journey with a fantastic community of like-minded women, all of whom continue to support each other no matter where we all live, and I no longer feel confused, misunderstood, worthless or alone. For me, this group has been both a lifesaver and a life changer, and most importantly, the one-to-one private coaching sessions that are available with Dr Gordon as part of the membership have been invaluable to me. They provide me with an opportunity to discuss more difficult and private issues that I am struggling with and an opportunity to find solutions to address them. Without doubt, I can wholeheartedly say that I owe Dr Gordon and her group everything for showing me how to take my life back and, more importantly, take control of it. Joining her membership has been the best thing that I have ever done. However, this course is not for everyone. If you're looking for a quick fix that doesn't cost you any time, money or effort then this is not the group for you. But if you're in a similar situation to how I was not that long ago, feeling desperate and at the end of your tether, but are willing to invest in your own future happiness and peace of mind, but are unsure as to what to do, ask questions and talk to Dr Gordon. And if you choose to take that leap of faith, you won't regret it. 
because who wouldn't want to take their life back if they had the chance? If you are feeling like Amanda, you're not alone. There is help for you in the Menopause Movement membership. I want to help you transcend your symptoms and live your best life. To discover how you can become a part of this life-changing community, go to menopausemovement.com. Thank you.